little bit steer from that old Yorkshire geek, and it's list time. Yeah, but we're doing it a little bit different today. Uh, I'm not just finding an article of lists. Uh, I'm doing a, a personal list. I'm do- going to do my top ten favourite Star Trek episodes. So that's what I'm going to do. And it is actually a countdown from ten down to one. Some of them might surprise you. They are my favourite episodes. That doesn't mean they're the best ones. So there'll be a lot of episodes that you think, why hasn't he included that one? They're just the episodes that I tend to re-watch more than the others, uh, mostly. Uh, and a couple of others that you know have just stuck with me over, over the years, but I necessarily haven't watched them a lot. Uh, one in particular I don't like watching, uh, because it upsets me and it makes me cry and stuff like that. Uh, but it's still one of my favourites, so, you know, go figure. Uh, right, so, <coughs> as I said... Not necessarily the best episodes or the most popular episodes, but they're my favourites. So we will begin. I've tried to pick, by the way, from all iterations of Star Trek up to the Berman era. Uh, so there'll be no, there's no discovery of Strange New Worlds or Lower Decks or what's the other ones we've had? Um, um, uh, Picard, uh, none of them. Uh, Prodigy. Uh, there's no episodes from then. It is, it's classic Trek. That's what we'll say it is. It's classic Trek. Right. So, uh, we will begin. Hang on, I'll move my list over here. So, I'm looking at the camera as I read it. <laughs> oh, dear. Because I'm professional, you know. Um, anyway, this uh, video is going to be uh, exclusive on my Patreon for a couple of weeks. And then uh, it'll go public and I'll up, you know, and then it'll, it'll appear... Uh, on the YouTubes as well, for everybody to see and make fun of me. But uh, if you want to watch it early, um, you should have joined. You should have joined me Patreon because if you didn't, you're watching this on YouTube. I'm waffling. Right, we'll get on with it. Right, we will begin. Uh, I feel like uh, Fluff Freeman. I should do that. Um, in fact, I'll find it. I see if I can find that uh, clip and I'll play it now. Uh, Fluff Freeman, uh, the pop pickers, the uh, countdown. Oh, that's cool. But whatever, <laughs> I'm being daft. Right, at number 10, uh, this one's from the original series, it's Balance of Terror, uh, a popular one, I think a lot of people like this one, it's early on, uh, season 1, episode 14, I think when I bought it originally, when I started getting the VHSs, I think it was earlier on, um, I think it's one that were, were earlier in the um, broadcast schedule, but later, you know, it was readjusted, when the, when the changed you know the, the order of the, the original series about because um, they weren't they weren't broadcast in order of you know that they were made uh, or filmed or whatever you know what I mean I'm waffling again um, and I think this were originally earlier earlier because I, I remember it, it it were on the same tape same VHS tape as Charlie X which were another early one uh, it wasn't number 40 it wasn't episode 14 I don't think it was anyway but anyway whatever uh, Balance of Terror. So it's it's the submarine one in space with Captain Kirk and the Enterprise. I've got to play a game of cat and mouse with a, a Romulan bird of prey that's got a cloaking device. Not the best cloaking device in the world. Because <laughs> they, they, basically they know it's there. It, it kind of appears as a reflection. Uh, so they know it's there, but they're not sure if they're looking at a reflection of their own ship some of the times. It's, it's kind of a bit confusing sometimes. Um, but it's a great game of cat and mouse. Um, who's going to get the upper hand um, and all that stuff and they do the old submarine warfare tropes putting you know debris uh, into torpedo tubes and dead bodies to make them think that they've damaged the other ship and all that stuff uh, and it has a, you know a somber ending um, but uh, and, and then the episode got butchered in um, Strange New Worlds didn't it at the end of season 1 and I like Strange New Worlds but that episode uh, where they did the balance of terror again. Bloody awful. But anyway. So there we go. That's my number 10. Uh, number 9. This one's from Enterprise. Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, Carbon Creek. Uh, from season 2. Uh, episode 2. Uh, I like this one. Um, I'm not a big fan, usually, of... Um, um, ta- not, it's not time travel episodes, but it's... I don't know. Um, period. Period pieces, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not a big fan of period pieces in Star Trek or sci-fi in general. Um, but I, I really like this one. This one's essentially, it's T'Pol telling the story of of her, I forgot her name already, I'll, I'll put it there. Uh, 
or there or whatever. Um, talk, the story of her and her great great grandmother or whatever, who were um, made first contact with Earth in the 1950s. You know, over a hundred years before Zephyrin Cochrane made contact in Bozeman, Montana, in 2063. Um, she said that first contact was made um, in Carbon Creek, Pennsylvania, I think it is. Um, I've said it's my favourite, I can't bloody remember the places. What am I like? Um, in the 1950s, but it were all secret and hush-hush, so nobody ever knew about it. So what happened, uh, her great-great-great-grandmother um, was... Um, an officer on a, a Vulcan ship that were monitoring Earth's foray into, first foray into space. So it must be 1958, or it 57. <laughs> uh, they were watching the launch of Sputnik, so they were monitoring that. But then something happened, and the ship crashed uh, near Carbon Creek. Um, and just, uh, three of them survived. I think the captain died. Three of them survived. Um, to Paul's grandmother. Uh, took command of the, the, the team and they were running out of food because uh, they'd sent a distress signal and all that but they didn't know when anybody were going to come and collect them um, and they were running out of food so they thought well we're going to have to you know, venture into town so that's what they did they disguised themselves uh, covered up the pointy ears and all that and, and went into town and basically blended in for uh, several weeks I think they stayed or maybe months I think they were several months actually uh, in Carbon Creek, blending in, and they became quite popular members of the community. Uh, and by the end, one of them decides to stay back. I wonder what happened to him. I don't know, but one of them stayed on Earth, and we never heard from him again uh, because he fell, he kind of fell in love with um, uh, the woman that runs the bar in Carbon Creek. But it's a lovely, it's a lovely story, and it tells us how how we got Velcro <laughs> and um, and all that stuff. And then at the end, it's kind of alluded that she made it up. Um, they did um, to Paul to entertain the captain and trip, but then it suggested that it, it wasn't all made up at the end because she she had a, an heirloom from her great 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 grandmother uh, from back in the day. So there we go. So that's number nine, Carbon Creek. Um, number eight, uh, a Deep Space Nine episode, uh, The Visitor, and this is the one I was talking about. That it's one of my favourite episodes. Um, but I don't watch it a lot because it kind of upsets me. Um, because it, it, it's a very, you know, it's a very emotional episode, uh, and it's the visitor. Um, it's the one where uh, Ben Cisco, uh, who is, uh, is he's Captain Cisco at this time because it's season four, so he's Captain Cisco. Uh, Captain Cisco um, apparently he seems to die, or something happens to him. They think he's died. Uh, this accident, this warp car, this accident with the warp car, I think of the Defiant. Um, he just like it looks like he gets vaporized or whatever. So that obviously everybody's upset. But then um, Jake starts seeing him uh, over the years. You know the years that follow. Jake starts seeing him it, you know, appearing a bit like Kirk in the Tholian web. You know he just keeps appearing. Um, uh, and, and sometimes he talks to him and that. But then he disappears again. So. He realises his dad's not dead, he's like trapped in time and he just keeps popping into our time as, as the years go on. And Jake's getting older, he starts off as, you know, um, Cedric Lofton and then as he gets older he ends up becoming um, Tony Todd. Tony Todd plays old Jake and uh, he gives up his writing and he, be, he learns all about warp theory and stuff and he ends up working out how to save his dad. Um, uh, and he does, and he does save his dad, but obviously he saves him back at the beginning. So obviously it never happened, so everybody's none the wiser at the end. But he's really upset, too, especially when he's, when uh, Ben Sisko's seeing old Jake, you know, and they're all crying and stuff, and I'm crying. I'm filling up now thinking about it, so we'll move on. <laughs> so that was number eight, The Visitor. Uh, number seven, sticking with Deep Space Nine, uh, The Gem Hadar. I like this episode. It was the, um, the, 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 the cliffhanger episode, sort of, for season two. Um, so it were episodes 26 of season two. Um, the Gem Hadar. And this one sees um, uh, Ben and Jake and Nog. Uh, they're going on um, a, a school field trip into the Gamma Quadrant. They're taking a runabout into, through the wormhole into the Gamma Quadrant. Um, Quark tags along, uh, but 
he says it's to, to keep an eye on his nephew, Nog, but really it's, he wants to get round um, Captain Cisco because he wants something, you know, some, some money making scheme uh, in his bar or on the promenade. You know, and he wants to get the captain by himself so he can talk him into you know, whatever scheme he's got planned. But obviously things go awry and they come across the Jem Hadar, where the soldiers of the Dominion. Um, and, and also they come across a Vorta, uh, a woman. Uh, who's a Vorta, so that's the first time we see them. And she has abilities that we never see in the Vorta again. She kind of has these like telekinetic powers. Uh, but we never see the Vorta have those again, so I don't know. Uh, and they also seem to have long range transporters, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, whatever. So they come across those and then they get captured by the Gem Hadar. Um, uh, meanwhile, obviously, because they're missing, uh, oh, Jake and Nog escape the gem hadar they don't get caught and they end up on the on the runabout and try and pilot it back to the wormhole um but um others have gone looking for them and the kind of fleet not a fleet but um the uh, the uss odyssey which is a galaxy class ship uh goes into the gamma quadrant with a few runabouts um to look for uh, captain cisco uh, it's not captain it's commander cisco at that time uh, look for Commander Cisco, and they come across the Gem Hadar, and uh, the Gem Hadar have had enough. The Dominion has had enough of the, the incursions into their space from from the Alpha Quadrant, and you know they're not going to allow it anymore. And we learn that they've destroyed the Bajoran colonies in the Gamma Quadrant, and uh, they're not going to stand for it anymore. So this is essentially the start of the Dominion War, um, essentially. Uh, so there's a big space battle. The USS Odyssey gets destroyed. Um, Obviously, they save Cisco and all that. So, you know, they they get away um, with the help of the Vorta woman. Who it turns out, you know, is uh, we know now in hindsight, but it turns out she's working for the Dominion, and um, she kind of she beams away from the station, but the, there's no ships or anything, so they don't know where she's beamed to, or did she just beam herself into space to like you know sacrifice herself? I don't know, but. Uh, but Cisco says uh, he has a feeling we'll see her again, but we never do. <laughs> so I don't know. But that's a good episode. I like that one, the Gem Hadar. Right, uh, uh, next up, number six, uh, a Next Generation episode from season six, episode 25, Timescape. I like this one as well. Um, uh, I've got another runabout in it. I think it's the only time we see a runabout in the Next Generation. Um, Captain Picard and uh, Diana and. Data and Geordi, is it just them? Uh, and maybe Beverly, no not Beverly, no not Beverly, um, I think it's just them four, I think, I, can't, I could be wrong. Uh, they've been to some um, symposium somewhere, um, uh, left the Enterprise, they've gone, gone to do that, and they're coming back, they're, they're on the way back and they're telling you know, their, their adventures they had at this symposium and seminars they went to and how it was very boring. Um, but then they encounter these weird effects in time. The, the, the runabout starts coming across these like ripples in time. Um, Picard's fingernails grow suddenly through rocks really quickly and stuff like that. And uh, anyway, the, the plot of course to the, you know, where it's originating, it's the Enterprise. The Enterprise seems to be in battle with a Romulan warbird. Um, there seems to be you know, energy beams coming between both. And, uh, well, there's an energy beam coming from the, the Enterprise to the Warbird, but the Warbird's shooting at the Enterprise. But it's all frozen in time, or it seems to be frozen in time. Uh, so they've got to find a way to get aboard the Enterprise, to see what's going on. But obviously, if they enter that time bubble, they'll freeze as well. So a good old Geordi uh, works out um, um, a device that they put on the, the, their arms that uh, is kind of like a force field. Kind of reminded me a bit of the force fields that they used to have in uh, Star Trek, the animated series. They used to use, instead of wearing spacesuits, they used to have these little personal force fields so they could walk about uh, in space or on a moon or whatever. And it kind of reminded me of that. So Geordi uses that to keep them in, in normal time. So that's what they're doing. They go, um, they go aboard the Enterprise and they see that there's Romulans there, and uh, but they see that a Romulan's shooting, in the process of shooting Beverly Crusher. Um, so they're wondering what's going on, but then they, they find out that it's not, um, it's not, they're not frozen in time, they're just moving forward really slowly. Um, 
Oh, then Picard kind of wigs out a bit and we see there's a warp core breach. We go to engineering, there's a warp core breach in process. In process, in progress. With steam coming out of the warp core. And Picard kind of wigs out a bit and goes a bit crazy and starts laughing and giggling and draws a smiley face in the steam. So they get out of there thinking, oh, we, we better get out of here because obviously it's having an effect. Um, anyway, it turns out um, that um, it's, it's aliens. Uh, Romulans use a forced quantum singularity as their power source uh, in their ships and the, um, somehow they came across some aliens that um, uh, are attracted to the singularity because they use them as like a nursery um, and they think the, you know, the, the Romulans are inadvertently killing their young so these aliens are doing stuff to, uh, to, to save their kids and obviously the, you know, everybody saves the day and um, uh, we see, I think we see the, the Enterprise blow up and stuff like that, and then time reverses, and you know all this, all this stuff happens, and it's uh, it's a cool episode. It's a cool episode. So there we go. Uh, so that was uh, Timescape. Right, uh, halfway through the list, we're halfway through. Right, number five, a Voyager episode from season one, episode six, Eye of the Needle. Um, it's another one of my favourites. I like this one. They come across early on on their voyage back to the Alpha Quadrant after being deposited in the far end of the Delta Quadrant by the caretaker. Uh, they're on the way back home and they come across a wormhole and uh, they send a probe out and they, they find out that it, it exits um, in the Alpha Quadrant. And um, they, they detect a ship on the other side. Unfortunately, the wormhole's too small. For, for the Voyager to go through, it's like, you know, it's a case of like millimetres in diameter, because uh, the probe actually gets stuck in the wormhole, but it, 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 it gets caught in like eddies in the wormhole, and um, but they can still use it to send signals back and forth, so they contact the ship on the other side, and they find out it's a Romulan ship, and uh, they get in touch with the Romulan uh, commander, who's willing to speak to them, uh, you know, initially is suspicious, because, you know, Romulans and all that, um, but uh, they end up cooperating with each other and um, think that well, what they could try and do is beam the Voyager crew to the Romulan ship, um, essentially abandoning Voyager in the Delta Quadrant and the Doctor, it seems. I think they'd find a way. They'd find a way to save his programme and take it with them, wouldn't they? But um, the, the, the kind of don't mention it to him. And I think he does say in the episode, it was nice of people to think of me or words to that effect. But um, anyway... So that's the plan. They're going to beam the crew to the, uh, the 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 Romulan ship, but then they find out that they can't do that because it's not the the, the it's not only a wormhole through space; it's a wormhole through time, and the Romulan ship is from f fifty three years or something in the past. So they decide that they think, well, we can't then we can't go because we'll be altering time and stuff. Uh, so they decide what they're going to do. They're going to give the Romulan commander a message to send to Starfleet at an appropriate time to, to tell them what's happened to Voyager. Not to tell them to stop Voyager, because they don't want to alter the timeline, stop Voyager from going to the Delta Quadrant, but to tell them, tell Starfleet what's happened, that the Voyager has survived, and you know they are, they're in the Delta Quadrant on the way home. Um, but unfortunately, um, we, we never know if he, tell, he tells Starfleet about it. We assume he doesn't. Um, because he died, he died before he had chance to uh, to do that. So there we go. And it's a good, it's a cool episode. I like Eye of the Needle. It's really good. Uh, and I've just spoiled it all for you. <laughs> uh, next up, Enterprise again, uh, number four uh, from season two, episode four. It's kind of I, I should have included two episodes here because it's kind of a two-part, uh, but not. But it is the connected. Uh, it's season 2, episode 4, uh, Dead Stop. Uh, the previous episode to this, episode 3, uh, was Minefield. Uh, it's featuring the Romulans again. Another episode I really like, even though it does mess with canon quite a bit. Um, uh, the Enterprise strays, well, not stray, because I don't know they're there, into a, a Romulan minefield around this planet that the Romulans have claimed. Uh, and there's cloaked mines. <clears throat> and the Enterprise, NX-01 Enterprise, uh, hits a mine and a big chunk of the Enterprise is, you know, blown up. Um, and so in this episode, they've still got that damage. Um, and in this episode, they learn from a Tellarite ship, they decide, you know, 
we've helped enough people while we've been out here. Pardon me. It's time for somebody to help us, so they send out a general dist distress signal. Excuse me. Anyway, tell her ship answers, and he says there's a repair station, you know, not far from where they are. So he gives them coordinates, and off they go. And they find this repair station where they learn it's automated, and um, there's nobody on board, and um, all it wants in payment is, I don't know, um, warp fluid or something, I can't really remember. But um, <laughs> uh, stuff that they've plenty of. Um, so they, they agree to it, and... You know, they get, the ship is scanned. It's all super advanced. It's all this uh, is this station, not built by the Tellarites, obviously. You know, they've, they've found it's been there, God knows how long. Um, and um, uh, so the, the repairs begin, and you know, they're told that certain areas of the ship that have been repaired they can't go to. Um, and there's a, a recreate, um, like a wreck deck, a recreate, re re recreation area. The crew can visit where they've got um, to where they first encounter um, replicators. So we see replicators in uh, Enterprise. Uh, so uh, Trip gets some um, um, pan fried uh, catfish and he thinks it's cool. And um, this is where we learn that, uh, that the station had scanned Enterprise's um, computers as well, which is how it knew about pan fried catfish. Anywho, um, uh, push comes to shove. Um, we learn that uh, there's a more sinister thing going behind, going in, in, in this station. Um, uh, Mayweather gets killed in an accident, uh, but then it turns out he's not dead. He's been kidnapped by the station, um, and and uh, a replicated body is left behind. And the doctor works out that it's not. Really, it's, you know, it's almost the exact copy of Mayweather, um, except um, some like these bacteria that, that should have been in Mayweather are dead, and you know and they shouldn't be dead. Um, so it's a, you know it's a copy. Um, so the the learn that uh, is being held in the station. The station uses living bodies as like its computer car, and uh, it obviously it needs replacements every so often. Uh, so they find all these all these alien races in this um, uh, in this, this this room. They're like Klingons and other other stuff. There might have been a Cardassian in there, I think maybe. Um, and uh, anyway, they save they save Mayweather because he hasn't been there long. All the others that have been there too long, and the brains you know the brains are mush essentially. But they get Mayweather out and destroy the station, um, uh, blow it up, and and carry on. So you know, it's like jumping out of a taxi, I suppose, and not paying. <laughs> um, but it ends in a you know a, a cool. Uh, kind of, I bet Brandon Braga wrote this. Um, I don't know if he did or not, but it's out. It's a bit of a Brandon Braga -y episode. We'll see. Um, but it ends where the station starts rebuilding itself. So it's still out there, but they never go back to it. So that's dead stop uh, and minefield um, for the, the the first part. Anyway, next up, number three, the top three, uh, is Next Generation Episode Season 3, Episode 1, Evolution, or Evolution, however you want to call it. Um, my favourite my favorite episode of TNG. A lot of people say, oh, you know, like, um, uh, Best of Both Worlds, or, um, um, oh, my brain's stopped working, Measure of a Man, you know, or The Inner Light. Uh, I like Evolution, uh, Evolution, ever. Um, I don't know, it's, it's one... You know, I'm a, I watch quite regularly. Uh, it's the first, you know, it's like season three is where generally where they think you know, TNG got into its stride, and uh, and Evolution is is it's a cosy episode. That's probably why I like it. It's a cosy, warm blanket episode where you're on the Enterprise. Um, Doctor Crusher's back because she'd left for a season. Now she's back, and we learn that. Um, uh, Wesley's this A student and he's working working too hard and he works that hard, he falls asleep uh, doing his studies and some nanites he were working on escape into the ship and start uh, reproducing and they end up taking over the ship. Meanwhile, they're at this, um, this star that's going to do like a stellar burst sort of thing. It does it every, every so often. It's like um, Old Faithful, you know, every... 
was it 100 and something years it'll uh, it does this big burst and uh, a, a scientist is there uh, with his probe uh, to study it and um, uh, he tries to kill these nanites that are inter interfering with his his experiment and so they take um, defensive action against him and um, but um, Anyway, thanks to Data, it's all resolved and uh, everybody lives happily ever after. And it's a cool episode. I really like Evolution. Right, number two, Voyager. Uh, this is a two-parter. Um, this is uh, from the end of Season 3, the beginning of Season 4. Of course, it's Scorpion, the Borg one, where they enter Borg space. You know, with the, the cool opening shot of the Borg cubes arriving. And there's, we are the Borg! And all that stuff, and then they just instantly get destroyed by you know, an unknown menace. So, and this is where we meet uh, species eight uh, eight four seven two. Is that right? Yeah, eight four seven two, isn't it? It's where we meet those for the first time, uh, and then we meet seven of nine uh, at the beginning of season four. Um, and it's uh, it's a cool episode where they've got to you know make a deal with the devil to get through Borg space. Uh, they've got to cooperate with the Borg. Uh, to defeat species 8472 um, which they do and um, and 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 you know uh, voyager prevails and uh, they end up getting a new crew member uh, in 7 of 9 which means we've got to jettison <laughs> kez uh, in, like, i think probably the very next episode anyway so there we go that's scorpion it's a cool episode and it's exciting and all the people like um um uh, Year of Hell and, and stuff, which is in the same season. Season 4 is an amazing season for Voyager. It's got Year of Hell and uh, the other one where the, the Herogen have taken over Voyager. I forgot what they call that one now. My brain's not working. Um, uh, they've got a few of these good two-parters. But, uh, it all began with Scorpion. Uh, a great episode, in my opinion. But my favourite episode of Star Trek, the, the episode I watch more than any other, uh, which probably might be a shock to anybody, it's, it's from Enterprise, it's season 2, episode 23, it's Regeneration. I love this episode, I'm always watching it. <laughs> um, it's got the Borg in it again, I tell you. How many Borg episodes have we got in this? Um, two. <laughs> I thought another one mentioned earlier on, never mind. Uh, the, it, some people have suggested that the the ship, the, the station in um, Dead Stop, may may have like Borg technology, which is how it can repair itself. I don't know, but anyway, uh, regeneration. Uh, it's kind of a sequel to Star Trek: First Contact. Uh, we learn what happened to the Borg sphere that the Enterprise um, E blew up back in 2063, and we learn that it crashed somewhere in the Arctic, um, and a, a team from Starfleet. Um, uh, find it and they the find some of the Borg. Obviously, they don't know the Borg, they don't know what they are, uh, but they find these you know, aliens uh, in the ice and, and obviously they come back to life because it's the Borg and they take over, the, they assimilate the science team and take their transport ship and off they go. And um, they just happen to be headed in the, the, the direction of the, the NX01 Enterprise, which is like months away from Earth, but uh, it just happens, happens to be heading that way. At, at, and it's going faster than that ship um, was designed to do. So obviously, you know, they've assimilated the ship as well and enhanced it. And the, the Enterprise have got to intercept it and try and work out what's happened. And we learn that um, you know the the can't save the crew. Uh, they've been uh, the, the the they encounter the the ship um, attacking another ship. So that you know they're busy assimilating other people as well. Uh, I think the the tele Tarkalians, I think they are. Uh, famous for their tea. But um, they've assimilated those as well. Um, and there's a, a nice bit where the Tarkalians that they rescue uh, have been assimilated. They turn into Borg and they get the Doctor. So he's got Borg nanoprobes in him, but he works out how to uh, get rid of them eventually. Uh, and it's a cool cat and mouse thing, you know, with the Borg. And they eventually do destroy them because, you know, the um they're in a ship that's not as powerful as the the enterprise and they haven't had chance to uh, enhance it enough but they do destroy it but not before they send a message to the delta quadrant which we learn i'll get there in say 300 years or 200 years or whatever um 
you know, in, in the same time as you know, did that mess well that message sent and that's why the Enterprise D encountered the Borg Cube at System J25 well that ship coming in response to the message sent in Enterprise I know it's head cannon but you could you could you could argue that but anyway that, there we go so that's it no my number one probably a shock to everybody uh an ent- uh, an episode of enterprise regeneration it's my favorite as i said they're not necessarily the best episodes of star trek but they're my favorite ones uh, so we'll go through them one more time we'll go through them one more time so at number 10 it's Balance of Terror from the original series. Number nine, Carbon Creek from Enterprise. Number eight, The Visitor from Deep Space Nine. Number seven, The Gem Hadar, also from Deep Space Nine. Number six, Timescape uh, from Next Generation. Number five, Eye of the Needle from Voyager. Number four, Dead Stop from Enterprise. Number three, Evolution, Evolution, whatever is your poison, from The Next Generation. Number two, Scorpion from Voyager. And my number one, is Regeneration from Star Trek Enterprise, although at that time it was just called Enterprise. It didn't get, it wasn't known as Star Trek Enterprise until season three. <laughs> anyway, so there we go. That's my list. So we'll leave it there. Hope you like that list. You probably disagree with every single one of my choices. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't blame you, but they just happen to be my favourite episodes of Star Trek. As I said, they're not necessarily the best. They're just my favourite ones. Right, so we'll leave it there. So, thanks for watching. Live long and prosper. And until next time, I'll see you there.